Hey, what's up, YouTube? Uh, it's BeetlePlayer1011 here, and today we'll be going over the uh, derivation for Kepler's second law. And if you watched the video for Kepler's first law, uh, it should be relieving to know that this derivation is much simpler. So I wrote two equations over here, uh, and these are ones that will be basically the only equations that we'll need for this entire derivation. The first one is uh, the equation for angular momentum, which is L equals I times omega. L is the angular momentum, uh, which we really have a vector, uh, insertion omega. But basically, uh, uh, what this is, is a description of the uh, momentum it has as an object rotates around a center axis point. And in the case of a planet, we have basically a point mass rotating around, uh, as you can see in what actually looks like an egg, uh, rotating around our sun. That was supposed to be a sun. Now, the I is the rotational, uh, mass, or the moment of inertia, and that is given by mr squared for a point mass, and this can be treated as a point mass since it's a point about 93 million miles away from the axis, which is the center of the sun. Uh, now, this could be the center, if the center were, like, through the center of the Earth, it would be 2 fifths mr squared. Uh, that would be the rotational inertia for a sphere. But it's a point mass, so this is easy. Uh, omega, by definition, is d theta over dt. Omega is the rotational velocity, so it's the change in theta over change in time. In the same way, uh, the velocity is the change in distance over change in time. This is literally just taking these units and converting it into uh, rotation. Uh, the formula below that uh, here is the area of a sector. So the area of a sector is equal to one half r squared theta, uh, where this theta is the degree in radians that the object has traveled, and uh, one half r squared. R squared is obviously just the radius or the distance to the circle. Uh, now, you may be asking, uh, how can this formula be used as the area of a sector of a circle? Now, you'll see that when we uh, when we are working with this, we're going to be taking this as the area approaches zero, and as theta approaches zero. So the radius, the change in radius is very uh, negligibly small, I can, as uh, you could think of it that way. Also, uh, I think an easy way of remembering this is that this is really, really similar to the area of a triangle. And it, you can imagine this as a triangle where the base is simply just the uh, length of this in radians multiplied by the... Uh, it's one half uh, base times height, basically, right? Where uh, the height is basically like the radius. So uh, it's similar to that. The derivation is uh, more in line with like the entire circle. So if you think of it, the area of a circle in its entirety, uh, I'll just write it down here. Is if you can think of the area of a circle, uh, you can always skip through this part if you already know this, uh, but this is for those who are curious about it. The area of an entire circle is pi r squared. So, in the entire circle, theta is 2 pi, because uh, the entire circle goes through 360 degrees, and uh, 360 degrees in radians is 2 pi. So as we can see here, pi is just one half of theta, so that's where we get the uh, area of a sector. Now let's get into the actual derivation. So we're going to be starting off with this formula over here, the area of a sector. So I'm going to rewrite it over here very quickly. The area is equal to one half uh, r squared theta. Now, we're going to be taking this as it approaches, uh, as basically is the limit of the area approaches zero, and what we get is that dA, uh, a very, very small area, uh, is equal to one-half r squared d theta. So d theta would be then d theta as uh, it approaches zero. So you can imagine, like, if I make this really, really small, sorry if this isn't, like, a straight line, 
this d theta is getting smaller as this line approaches zero and a approaches zero. So it's an infinitely small area correlated with an infinitely small uh, angle. Now what we're looking for is uh, the key to solving this is the change in area over change in time. Because what Kepler's second law says, and uh, I probably should have explained this earlier, but uh, Kepler's law says that an area, uh, a planet will sweep the same amount of area in uh, a given time, which means that the change in area over change in time should be equal to zero. So to visualize this, we can look at this uh, diagram over here, where we have a planet orbiting around its star. Now, this part is the perihelion, which means that the planet is closer to the sun here than it is over here. At this point, uh, the planet actually has to go faster to cover the same amount of area than the planet over here, because the R is really large over here, whereas the R is very small over here. So as you can see with this area equation, the angle has to be larger when the R is smaller, so the planet has to go faster. And this explains why the planet is actually slightly faster when it's going, uh, when it's closer to the star than when it's not. But we want to mathematically prove that, uh, because, and we're going to do that using, uh, the conservation of angular momentum. So, let's rewrite the, uh, formula by plugging in what we know for, um, all of uh, our variables, which is i and omega, where i is mr squared and omega is d theta over dt. Now, sorry if that was sloppy. Uh, what we want to do is we want to substitute dA in terms of dt, because what we're trying to find is dA with respect to dt. So we're going to rewrite this equation just simply as d theta is equal to L, uh, let me just write that, is equal to L over mr squared dt. I'm just multiplying the dt on uh, both sides, and then dividing mr squared on both sides. So now that we have our expression for d theta, we can then uh, plug that in. So we have dA equals, and then you should probably see where, where I'm going with this now. Uh, you have r squared multiplied by L over MR squared DT. Now, we're trying to find DA with respect to DT, so we can divide DT on both sides just to get that. We can also, if you notice, cancel the R squareds out. Uh, by the way, I made a mistake earlier. I think I said that dA dt should be equal to zero. What I mean is that this should be equal to some constant. The rate of change is constant. Uh, that is a bad mistake, but hopefully you still understand it. Uh, the second derivative would be equal to zero, but you'll see that the final result now will be equal to a constant. Uh, so we end up with, uh, dA over dt is equal to L over 2 M. And that's it. Uh, like I said just now, dA over dt should be a constant k, and we know from the conservation of angular momentum that L is constant, and the mass is always the same, because when it moves around, it's not like it's undergoing uh, great changes in terms of its mass, uh, and the 2 is just a number, it's a constant number. So we get that the rate of change of area with respect to time is L over 2M. Uh, we also can get then that the rate of change of area, or, or uh, not the rate of change, the area in terms of time uh, is equal to L over 2, LT over 2M. Because if you think about it, uh, this will be helpful in Kepler's third law, which I'll be covering soon. Uh, because if you think about it, if we go back to the equation we had before, uh, we could just take the integral of both sides, uh, I'll put, put it over here. You factor all these constants out, and what you're, and, uh, we'll do this from 0 to a, and then this will be from 0 to t. 
And then what you end up with is that uh, the fa uh, all these constants factor out. The integral of dt is just t, and the integral of dA is just a, from 0 to a and 0 to t. Uh, and so you'll end up with this. And that's really it. It's uh, the simplest derivation, I think. So thank you for watching.